the past few discussions, we have come across several instances where the task of learning an ML model boiled down to solving an optimization problem. Examples include the SVM that can be used to solve binary classification problems such as cracking puffs to reveal cybersecurity vulnerabilities and least squares regression that we used in the find my salary example. Click on the links above to view those discussions again. Today, we will look at some of the most popular techniques used to solve such optimization problems. My dear friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's get started. Our focus will be on unconstrained optimization problems where there is just an objective function and no constraints. SVMs and least squares regression are popular examples of unconstrained optimization in machine learning. Before going ahead with this discussion, you may want to refresh your calculus basics. Click on the link above to revisit the calculus refresher video. If the objective is differentiable, then calculus tells us that the solution must be a stationary point, which gives us our first optimization technique, the first order optimality method. In this technique, we simply search for all stationary points of the objective function and inspect each one of them to see which one is the global optimum. Here we see a simple example of the FOO technique at work. The main advantage of the FOO technique is that it's a super simple method. However, it works only on unconstrained optimization problems. This is because for constrained optimization problems, the objective gradient may not vanish even at the optimum. For example, in a previous discussion, we have seen that for least squares regression with the least squares loss, Applying FOO gives us the solution in closed form. That is, we have a formula that evaluates to the optimal model. However, if we replace this least squares loss with, say, the logistic loss, which we will study in a future discussion, applying FOO tells us that the optimal model must satisfy this complicated looking equation, which does not simplify the problem at all. FOO is similarly tricky to use if the objective is non differentiable. To handle such cases, we must adopt a more gradual approach and not expect to get the solution in closed form right away. Before we move on to discuss these trickier cases, here are some optimization problems where the FOO technique does apply. Solve these exercise problems to develop your intuition on when is it useful to apply the first order optimality technique. To understand how functions can be minimized gradually, Consider this 2D Euclidean plane and this flat looking function that takes a 2D vector as input and gives a real number as output. The color of the plane indicates the function value, yellow indicating high function value and blue indicating low function value. We are currently at a point x on the 2D plane and we wish to go to a different point where the function value is lower. To find out which direction accomplishes this job the best, let us promise to move only a distance r in any direction. This magenta circle shows us the points to which we can move. We see that although we move the same distance r, if we move in certain directions, the function value hardly changes at all. In other direction, the function value changes slightly. It either goes up a bit or it goes down a bit. However, in some special directions, the function value changes the most, going up by a very large amount or going down a very large amount. It is this magical direction of steepest descent that we are seeking. This is the direction in which if we move, it gives us the maximum decrease in the function value. This intuition applies to even non-linear functions if r is small. Since at small enough scales, even non-linear functions look reasonably flat. To get hold of the steepest descent direction, let us invoke the Taylor's theorem for multivariate functions that we have seen in earlier discussions. The Taylor's theorem tells us that for nice functions, if we move along a vector t from a point x0, the function value changes roughly according to the dot product of the vector t and the gradient of the function at the point x0. There is a correction or residual term here, which we are denoting by r, but that can be neglected if we don't move too much, which means if the vector t has small enough Euclidean length. Given this, a proof involving very simple geometric principles tells us that in order to decrease a function value the most, 
we must move in the direction opposite to that of the gradient. Note that this result may fail if we move too much since in that case the residual term may become so large that the function value increases even though we move opposite to the gradient. The simple realization gives us arguably one of the most popular optimization techniques out there, gradient descent. To apply this technique to minimize a function f, we initialize the function at some point and in each iteration we compute the gradient at our current point and then move a tiny bit opposite to direction of the gradient to change the current point. This is repeated until we converge. If we are dealing with non-differentiable objectives, we can always use subgradients in place of gradients. There are several unknowns in this algorithm such as how to choose an initial point, how much to move in the direction opposite to the gradient, what is convergence and how to detect if we have converged. These issues will be handled in a future discussion. Note that the current point will stop changing the moment we hit a stationary point. The gradient descent algorithm can be said to have converged in this case and we can stop the algorithm. Also, note that how much we move in each iteration is decided by this parameter called the step length or learning rate. The names given to this parameter are a bit misleading since the actual amount we move in each iteration is decided by both the length of the gradient or subgradient in that iteration and the step length. Moreover, it is not the case that setting a large value of this parameter will speed up the gradient descent algorithm. In fact, this may actually backfire and give very poor results. Let us see the GD algorithm in action on this non-convex objective which has two local minima and one local maxima. The global minimum in this case is denoted by this star. We initialize at this point and find that the gradient points to the left. So gradient descent must move to the right. Computing the gradient at this new point tells us to move right again but by a smaller amount since the gradient at this point is much smaller in magnitude. At this new point, the gradient is almost zero but points to the right so we move a teeny tiny bit to the left and we can see that we have almost reached a local minimum. Note that GD will converge here since this is a stationary point. You may have noticed that we converged but to the wrong local minimum. This can be blamed on bad initialization. There are clearly two wells in this function surrounding the two local optima. Had we initialized in the correct well, as we shall see here, we would have indeed converged to the global optimum in a few iterations. However, note that bad choice of step lengths can undo the benefit of good initialization. For example, even if we initialize correctly, but then choose a very large step length, then we may overshoot the global optimum and land up in the other well instead and then converge to the wrong local minimum. Initialization is not that big an issue with convex functions where there is just one well so to say and all local minima are global minima as well. However, even here if our step lengths are too large then we may end up jumping from one point to the other without ever approaching a stationary point. The version of GD that we have just seen is hardly ever used as is since it is quite expensive. Consider this SVM objective with n data points and d dimensional features. Calculating a single subgradient for this objective would take order n d time, which can be too much, especially since getting hold of the exact subgradient is not even that necessary. Descent algorithms are expected to work just fine even if given a good enough estimate of the descent direction since we only move a teeny tiny bit in that direction. The trick to making GD more efficient is to get a quick approximation to the gradient. One such approximation is the so-called stochastic gradient which computes a descent direction using a single randomly chosen data point. A random point is chosen to give all points a fair chance to participate in this process. Computing the stochastic gradient takes only order d time making it far faster than GD. Take care that we may need to execute more iterations of SGD than we had to do for GD. However, this is still preferable since each SGD iteration is so much cheaper than a GD iteration.
To understand the SGD algorithm better, let us take a look at the behind the scenes action when we execute this algorithm. We will analyze a single iteration of the SGD algorithm when the step length eta is restricted between 0 and 1. In this case, the new model is the old model scaled by 1 minus eta to which the subgradient term due to the hinge loss is added. Note that we restricted eta to be less than 1 since funny things can happen for larger step lengths, for example, when eta is set to 2. Let us analyze what SGD does if we set a very low or very high value of eta. In this case, if eta is set to a vanishingly small value, it is easy to see that the model will not move at all and the initial model will pretty much be the final model returned by the SGD algorithm. Now let's look at the other extreme when eta is set to a value very close to 1, its largest value. We see that the new model in this case is completely dictated by the data point chosen in that iteration. The new model has no relation whatsoever with the previous model. This is bad news since this means that the model will never learn how to do well on the entire training set as a whole. As we will see below, SGD with this large step size will constantly forget everything it has learnt in the past and just focus on doing well on the currently chosen point. Note that if the old model was doing poorly on the chosen data point, the new model will rush to readjust itself to perfectly classify the data point. However, if the old model was already doing well on the chosen data point, then the algorithm will set the new model to zero in an effort to improve the performance on the half norm W square part of the objective. This shows how using a large step size can lead to chaotic results. Now let's look at a setting where the step length is set to a more moderate value, let's say half. We will see that the SGD algorithm will make much more commonsensical decisions in this case. First of all, we note that the new model in this case depends on the old model as well as the currently chosen data point. That is, the algorithm correctly remembers its past learning as well as tries to incorporate new information from the current data point. In case the old model was not doing well on the chosen data point, we see that SGD attempts to improve the performance on that data point. However, if the old model was already doing well on the data point, then SGD just scales the old model down again in an attempt to improve performance on the half norm W square term of the objective function. Note that the new model will continue to classify the chosen data point correctly, although with a smaller margin. I hope that this small case study demonstrates the benefits of setting step lengths carefully in descent algorithms. Now, despite its speed and simplicity, the SGD algorithm as we have presented earlier can suffer from large variance and stability issues as it uses a single data point to get a descent direction in each iteration. This is more likely if the data is very diverse. In this cartoon, we see a scenario where the individual data points are offering subgradients that point in very diverse directions. Now, GD would have averaged all these out to get the overall subgradient. In this cartoon, the red point is the initial model and the golden point is the optimal model. We see that despite the large cost of each iteration, GD makes targeted progress towards optimality. SGD, on the other hand, trusts a single data point to get a descent direction. Although this is cheap, this cartoon shows that this can cause SGD to take a very meandering and jittery route to the optimum. A simple way to solve this issue is to get a descent direction by choosing more than one, let's say B data points in each iteration. Sure, each iteration will be a bit more expensive but as this cartoon shows, this descent direction may be a much better approximation to the actual subgradient and give far more stable progress. Due to these attractive features, mini batch gradient descent is a core component of modern deep learning libraries. It turns out that there is a completely different route to making gradient descent more scalable. This technique relies on the fact that if careful bookkeeping is done, which will be the topic of a future discussion, then computing the partial derivatives of a function may be far cheaper than computing its full gradient or subgradient. This gives us the coordinate descent algorithm. At each iteration, one of the d coordinates of the model is chosen. 
the partial derivative of the objective is computed along that coordinate and just that coordinate of the model is updated. All other coordinates are fixed to their old values. Note the beautiful duality between SGD and coordinate descent. SGD uses a single data point to compute a descent direction for all D coordinates of the model, whereas coordinate descent uses all N data points to compute the descent direction for a single coordinate. There are several variants of coordinate descent depending on how the coordinates are chosen in each iteration. Stochastic coordinate descent chooses the coordinates randomly, while cyclic coordinate descent chooses them cyclically. A very effective version in practice called random permutation coordinate descent permutes the coordinates randomly and chooses the coordinates in that order. Once all the D coordinates have been chosen, a new random permutation is generated and the process is repeated. There's another version of coordinate descent known as a block coordinate descent and this variant may remind you of mini batch SGD since block coordinate descent updates several coordinates at once. An intriguing variant of coordinate descent that deserves special mention is coordinate minimization which reduces the original d-dimensional optimization problem into a series of one-dimensional optimization problems. Just like coordinate descent, Coordinate minimization also updates a single coordinate in each iteration. However, unlike coordinate descent that just takes a descent step along the chosen coordinate, coordinate minimization completely minimizes the function along that coordinate. This is usually possible in several machine learning applications, some of which we will see in future discussions. As before, we can have variants of coordinate minimization based on how we choose the coordinates in each iteration. Coordinate minimization can offer very rapid progress and is a core component of modern SVM solvers in popular machine learning libraries. It would be nice if you could apply some of the optimization techniques we have learned in this discussion to solve the ridge regression problem. First, try to solve it using coordinate descent. Then see if coordinate minimization is possible or not. Finally, apply SGD to solving this problem. Today, we took a deep dive into optimization routines for unconstrained optimization problems. We saw that sometimes we are able to find the stationary points directly and we also noted that this stationarity trick may not work if there are constraints in the optimization problem. For general problems, we looked at descent algorithms such as gradient descent and noted that choices such as proper initialization and appropriate step length are essential to their success. We then looked at two classes of techniques that make gradient descent more scalable. The first one was SGD and its cousin, the mini batch SGD, that made model updates using one or a small set of data points. The second was coordinate descent and its cousin coordinate minimization that made updates to a single coordinate of the model being learned. In the next discussion, we will see how the techniques we have learned can be used to handle optimization problems which also have constraints. So that's all for today. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will look forward to meeting you next time.